a warning, this episode contains descriptions of mutilation, war, and violence against children and may not be appropriate for all audiences. When I was a kid, we rarely heard about Native American communities. Maybe, sure, how Columbus encountered them when he quote-unquote discovered America. But otherwise, indigenous history seems to stop about 150 years ago in classrooms, museums, and in the public consciousness. So, you know, we didn't learn the names of the tribes that lived around our homes, and I had no idea where the reservations were. And it wasn't just my generation. One of my children's friends told me they believed all Native Americans had gone extinct. But lately, the American public has been learning that's far from the case. In the news, we're hearing a lot from indigenous communities. People, Indian boarding schools remain a dark and hidden history. And in fact, this indigenous people have been protesting Mount Rushmore since there was a Mount Rushmore. In Wyoming alone, 710 indigenous people were reported missing between 2011. This land means everything. Look at over there, all the buffalo. Look at all those buffalo. As a reporter covering tribal issues in Wyoming, I found it interesting that a lot of the most active and vocal voices have come from tribes in the American West. And when you sit down with the movers and the shakers, you hear what's motivating them is a desire to heal a history that feels very recent, very raw. The Plains Indian Wars, a series of brutal battles in the mid and late 1800s, in school, I didn't learn much about these wars at all. If I did, it was about isolated battles, like what the history books call Custer's Last Stand and maybe Wounded Knee. But actually, most of them can be traced back to one horrific massacre. Sand Creek. From Wyoming Public Media and PRX, this is the Modern West, exploring the evolving identity of the American West. I'm Melody Edwards. This season of the Modern West, we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to set aside the history books and instead focus on hearing this story and its long-term repercussions from the survivors themselves and directly from their descendants. For me, this season feels like the culmination of years of research. In my mid-20s, I lived outside Flagstaff, Arizona, in a canvas geodesic dome with a 75-mile view of the painted desert out my door. The border of the Navajo reservation was only a few miles away, and my neighbors, Gary and Teresa, lived a traditional lifestyle in a five-sided hogan. Sometimes I substitute taught at a nearby Navajo boarding school. But mostly, I was a preschool teacher in town, where about half of my students were either Navajo or Hopi. So were some of my co-workers. My friend Diana invited me to attend ceremonies on 3rd Mesa, where she grew up. Even after I moved back to Colorado, we stayed pen pals. And those experiences, those relationships, they got me thinking and reading. I realized there were huge gaps in my knowledge of the history of the American West. Years later, I got a job covering the Wind River Reservation for Wyoming Public Radio and started hearing that story in greater detail. One of the first stories I reported on was the end of the Bighorn adjudication case, the longest-running lawsuit in the U.S. history in which the Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone tribes fought for their water rights. Another was a U.S. Supreme Court case to prove that the city of Riverton was inside reservation boundaries. One thing I noticed right away when covering these stories was that people always linked present-day events to the past. Those literal battles with the federal government for sovereignty, they've never ended, I kept hearing. It's all still history in the making. But that perspective usually got edited out of my reporting. Not enough room too complicated. So this season, I'm going to keep all that in. I'm going to reach out to my colleagues and friends from Wind River and across the West and trace a through line from the Plains Indian Wars to life in indigenous communities today. But one thing I've learned over the years is that as a white woman, I've got to be extra careful to not make any assumptions about what I think I know. As Americans, we all think we know this era in history, 
We've seen it played out a million times in old Western movies. Believe me, I know how hard it can be to let go of our most basic myths, especially in the American West. But this season, I'm inviting you, the listener, to set aside what you think you know and listen to the voices of indigenous history keepers themselves and experience the battlefields and their aftermath from their point of view. Today, we'll start the story at the beginning, on the high prairie of what is now eastern Colorado, on land that was set aside for the Cheyenne and Arapaho by treaty, on the banks of Sand Creek. Ever since I learned about the Sand Creek Massacre, I've wanted to make a pilgrimage to see the site. It feels like, as a Westerner, it's my responsibility, like visiting a Holocaust memorial if you're German. So my photographer Anna Castro and I made the journey. To get there, we drove due east of the city of Denver. It was a long drive, towns getting smaller and smaller as we went, until we were almost to Kansas. Turn right onto County Road West. It's a cold, bright day in early January. January 6th, actually. The one-year anniversary since the insurrection on the United States Capitol. That feels significant. It also happens to be only a few weeks after the anniversary of the massacre. The last town we drive through is called Shivington, named after Colonel John Shivington, the man who ordered and committed the massacre of over 200 Arapaho and Cheyenne people just a few miles away from here. Shivington is really just a ghost town now. There's a newish looking church with a playground. We stop and photograph an old storefront with sun streaming through the roof beams a shattered TV inside, a child's shoe. Then we continue down the road. The destination is on your right, Sand Creek Massacre site. Arrived. We climb out of the car and feel it instantly, the pure quiet of this place. Why? Why would a regiment of Colorado volunteer soldiers come all this way to attack a peaceful village of mostly elderly and women and children? We start walking up the path, trying to understand. We pass cottonwood trees that were alive during the massacre. Witness trees, descendants call them. And consider them very special. When we reach an overlook, there's some binoculars to look through down onto the massacre site. There's also a map. So I'm now looking down at the creek, and I can see that War Bonnet's camp was off kind of farthest up the creek, and then White Antelope, Lone Bear, and then Black Kettle and Left Hand. Oh, and then here's where the troops, it shows the, the, there's arrows pointing at how they came in. So they came in and Sand Hill camp would have been off to the right as they entered into the camps. And they would have come right around. Left hand would have been the first camp that they came to, that they would have started firing into. We read a plaque that attempts to describe the politics at play just before the attack. All this land was supposed to be protected from the encroachment of settlers, part of the Fort Lyon Reservation. But it wasn't clear who was in charge. Colorado assigned one Indian agent to interact with the tribes on the government's behalf. The feds assigned another. The Treaty of Fort Wise promised government assistance with teaching the Cheyenne and Arapaho to farm. No instructors were ever sent, though. <laughs> Those Cheyenne and Arapaho that did move to the reservation were Then in 1858, gold was discovered in Colorado, and the two tribes' hope for a place to permanently call their own were dashed. That's what Ben Ridgely tells me when I meet up with him at the Wind River Casino. Ben's the tribal historic preservation officer for the Northern Arapaho tribe. He was the chairman of his tribe once, too. Plus, he's related to Little Raven, one of the only peace chiefs that survived Sand Creek. Ben is an older guy, but styly, always sporting a pair of shades and wearing a down puffy covered in shimmery diamond designs. He's also been a drummer in a local rock band since the 60s. 
Ben says his tribe had always loved Sand Creek and the wide open plains around it, full of wild game and medicines and everything that they needed. We camped all along that area in the winter because in the summer we were out in the mountains gathering our food and whatever we needed for the winter. We'd go out to Estes Park. We even camped in the area of Denver. We were in the Cherry Creek area all along. He says before the arrival of settlers, the Arapaho enjoyed the bounty of the mountains and the plains. After they arrived, though, it quickly dwindled. Trade routes had long brought news from tribes on the coast, and since the arrival of Europeans in the 1500s, they'd been watching their neighbors endure war and violence. And in the meantime, there were treaties that were developed to try to protect our people, both tribes. But then more and more encroachment came from the settlers. And then the gold rush, Pikes Peak, brought more and more people into the area. And that started to bring in more and more skirmishes with over land, even a buffalo wild game, because we depended on that for our people's uh, livelihoods to survive on. The settlers didn't know or care where the reservation boundaries even were. And the U.S. Army was too busy dealing with the Civil War to worry about defending it. So, Ben says, the Plains tribes started defending it themselves. Especially after Cheyenne Chief Lean Bear was gunned down under these orders from Colonel Shivington. Kill Cheyennes whenever and wherever they are found. And Lean Bear was shot wearing a Medal of Peace he'd just received from President Lincoln. After that, the tribes attacked settlers dozens of times, and Coloradoans started panicking. Historian Ari Kelman wrote one of the defining books on the Sand Creek Massacre called A Misplaced Massacre. I chat with him over Zoom, a scholarly gentleman with a neatly trimmed beard. Ari says the state's governor, John Evans, was one ambitious dude. Personally, he would like to be a a figure of some national political standing. And so he's looking for ways to advance himself in the eyes of, of the National Republican Party. And the way that he identifies is to move Colorado as quickly as possible from territorial status to statehood. And Evans understands that transition as being one that's going to hinge to a very significant extent on on his ability to, I'm going to use the language of the day, to pacify Indian peoples, uh, Native peoples. So the governor came in at that time, Evans, and he met with our chiefs. And in September of this year, the Sand Creek happened. And they happened to be uh, chiefs there, along with some of the cavalrymen, talked about us flying a flag or a truce to, to keep the peace. In his memoir, Life of George Bent, written from his letters, the Cheyenne warrior and leader recalls meetings with the Army, too and hears them with his own ears reassure his people that if they just cooperated, they'd come to no harm. George was the son of William Bent, a frontier trader who married Owl Woman, George's mom. His dad served as a mediator for the tribes. Plus, the family were friends with Black Kettle, one of the most passionate of the Cheyenne peace chiefs. Fifty or sixty Cheyennes from our camp went in with Black Kettle and the other chiefs to have a talk with the new commandant. Anthony met them in my father's old stone fort, which was now a part of Fort Lyon. What he told them convinced the Cheyenne more than ever that peace was sure to be made sooner or later. 
But Ben Ridgely says Governor Evans and Colonel Shivington, they weren't meeting with the leaders in good faith. In fact, their real plan was to wipe out all indigenous people who stood in their way. And he knew we were peaceful people. In all that time, Evans, they brought in some volunteers to train them. And their intent was to go down to fight our people. Because at that time, they put a law into effect that kill all the Indians. It's illegal because they were causing all this trouble for the settlers. During a year of independent study in college, Ben studied the story of Sand Creek. In his research, he found that the newspapers fanned the flames of hatred. It's amazing what Denver Post and Rocky Mountain News talked about natives at that time. They called us savages. It was really, really harsh how they, how they depicted us as people. They didn't, they didn't think we were people. And because of this, tensions in Colorado kept escalating. The tribes tried their best to cooperate. When the army asked them to turn themselves in to Fort Lyon in the summer of 1864, they went. Repeatedly, they find themselves dealing with uh, federal officials and territorial officials who ignore treaties and who over and over again side with settlers, in, in part because of the what we would call the, the racism of the day, white supremacy. There is an understanding that removing tribal peoples from Colorado territory can be equated uh, with progress. So yeah, the climate was filled with overt racism, but also, George Bent says, just plain negligence. Chivington began gathering his troops about November 20th. Most of his force was made up of the 3rd Colorado Cavalry, who were not real soldiers at all. This regiment had been hastily recruited from among the worst class of frontier whites, toughs, gamblers, and bad men from Denver and the mining camps, rough miners, bullwhackers, and so on. The men were not disciplined at all. Their officers had been selected by the vote of the men and had no real control over the men. The men were not even in uniform, and they were alike only in one thing. They were all eager to kill Indians. Ari says on paper, it didn't seem like Colonel John Shivington would have the makings of a war criminal. For one thing, he was a Methodist minister who preached strongly against slavery. One of his many uh, nicknames is the Fighting Parson. He is a very, very large man, stands well over six feet tall, weighs over 200 pounds. He has an extraordinary presence, has a booming voice, and so... He seems like good officer material. He serves uh, early in the Civil War with distinction. But like John Evans, Shivington had big aspirations. He also wanted to get into politics. And when the Cheyenne and Arapaho turned themselves in at Fort Lyon, he saw an opportunity. Shivington does everything he can to make sure that there will be a fight. He doesn't want to lose an opportunity to secure his reputation and, and potentially his standing in Colorado Territory and beyond. Two other military leaders tried to stop Shivington's attack. Captain Silas Sewell and Lieutenant Joseph Kramer weren't normally opposed to warring with Native Americans. But still, they both implored Shivington to see that these villages were filled with peaceful people, families, old folks. But Shivington ignored them. He marched on. The massacre commences when we return. At this point in our interview, Ari pauses. What ensues is an unimaginably horrific slaughter. Um, I don't want to get into great detail because it's, it's, in many ways, it's not my story to tell. But I, I'll, I'll simply say that somewhere between 175 and 250 or even maybe 275 
native people are are killed over the course of of a very long and bloody day. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those who are killed are either women or children or elderly men. Ari recognizes that as a non-native, the story of the massacre belongs to the Arapaho and Cheyenne. And that's what I came here for. At the Wind River Casino in Riverton, Wyoming, Ben takes me into a small museum off the hotel lobby. It's where a deer hide painting shows the massacre story as it was passed down by survivors. It hangs behind glass and fills the wall when you walk in. Ben's father, Eugene Ridgely Sr., painted the story on the hide after consulting with Cheyenne and Arapaho elders. And he said that he was thinking about doing something about Sand Creek. I told him he was going to do a hide. And that's why, why he did this story for the future of our people, what had happened at that day. This deer hide is considered the definitive indigenous perspective of the massacre. I saw it replicated often in my research, in the brochure and at the historic site visitor center. Ben says museums everywhere would love to get their hands on it. It's worth over a million dollars. But instead, it lives here on the reservation. Paintings like this were a traditional method of recording history, sometimes called winter counts because artists created them during winter months when people had more time to sit and recall the events of the last year. When you look closely at this one, you see in vivid colors what happened that day, November 29th, 1864. And just before dawn, they surrounded the camps. And Chief Black Kettle is pictured in is here. He? And he's right here with oh, the flag that's the flag, flag of truth. And he was the one that. Because he's got the American flag yeah. and then a white flag underneath this, that. This was called the flag of truth. Uh huh. And uh, when he had that. And then they lined up and they had cannons. They just shot the cannons, start firing. George Bent was one of the few Cheyenne warriors in camp that morning. He saw his friend Black Kettle rush out to meet the soldiers. I looked towards the chief's lodge and saw that Black Kettle had a large American flag tied to the end of a long lodge pole and was standing in front of his lodge holding the pole with the flag fluttering in the gray light of the winter dawn. I heard him call to the people not to be afraid that the soldiers would not hurt them. Then the troops opened fire from two sides of the camps. Everybody was all sleeping. There was hardly no warriors there. They timed it. They, they must have had the scouts or whatever, because they went out hunting. Mm -hmm. Is this some of the warriors going out? Yeah, they went out and they, they went out. <clears throat> there was an encampment that had over two, two, three thousand warriors. And they knew about that encampment. They didn't want to go over there. They knew there was just a bunch of old people, children, and a few warriors. That's why they attacked us. Ben says luring away the warriors by giving them permission to hunt was all part of Shivington's battle strategy and that the colonel knew that the Plains tribes rarely went to war in the winter. So the first thing the soldiers did was chase off the entire herd of ponies, 1,400 of them, so the people had no way to escape. Snow covered the prairie. Ben points at the painting at some tiny figures on their knees facing soldiers with rifles, spots of bright red on them. And the bad thing about this picture here it shows where 
people are running mm-hmm. with their kids. There was our dogs were there. There were little kids that were begging the soldiers not to shoot them on their knees, telling them. But they went ahead and shot them. And that was pretty brutal. Then they they uh, cut the babies out of the woman. Cut their body parts off, the men. And that battle went on all day. George Bent's friend, Little Bear, witnessed the atrocities firsthand. I passed many women and children, dead and dying, lying in the creek bed. The soldiers had not scalped them yet as they were busy chasing those that were yet alive. After the fight, I came back down the creek and saw these dead bodies all cut up and even the wounded scalped and slashed. I saw one old woman wandering about. Her whole scalp had been taken off and the blood was running down into her eyes so that she could not see where to go. In the movies, it's always the Native Americans who scalp people. But actually, the practice likely came over from Europe. And white people were more motivated to scalp Native people since the government paid a pretty penny for them. That day, on the meanders of Sand Creek, the soldiers took as many scalps as they could on Shivington's orders. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. Kill them all, big and little. Nits make lice. And they took much more. Soldiers cut off body parts for souvenirs, including genitals, men's and women's. Walking the trail at the massacre site, my photographer, Anna, remembered reading one story of a mother and her children. The letter said that she had been stabbed so many times, there was just, like, pieces of her, oh. like, falling off of her. Oh, my gosh. Like, flopping when they try to lift her. Oh, my gosh. And she was still alive, just slowly dying. And she kept asking for her children, and they never found one of her boys, so they... Imagine that he, like, got away because they never found him. But then his little girl was saved. And as soon as she heard that her little girl had been saved, the the woman telling the story was saying that she smiled and then she passed away. It was almost like she was holding out just to hear that her babies were okay. Yeah. The peace chiefs couldn't believe what was happening before their eyes. They'd promised their people they would be safe if they camped on Sand Creek. Promised them they could trust the U.S. government. George Bent witnessed the reaction of one chief. White Antelope, when he saw the soldiers shooting into the lodges, made up his mind not to live any longer. He had been telling the Cheyennes for months that the whites were good people and that peace was going to be made. And now he saw the soldiers shooting the people and he did not wish to live any longer. He stood in front of his lodge with his arms folded across his breast, singing the death song. The soldiers shot him, and he fell dead in front of his lodge. A full two thirds of the leadership of the Arapaho and Cheyenne were murdered at Sand Creek. 
One historian put it in perspective for me. Imagine our president, vice president, and two-thirds of our legislature killed in a single attack. The disruption and chaos it would cause to society. Once the brutal assault was underway, Captain Sewell and Lieutenant Kramer refused to participate. They marched their regiments across the creek and stood in formation, refusing to budge. Ben said, if they had joined the assault? If we went down with his troops, they would have wiped the whole, probably wiped the whole camp out. Really? Oh, no. To be honest and thoughtful about our people, we probably would have all not survived that day. In the deer hide painting, small figures with red gashes and missing limbs can be seen fleeing up the creek. They dug holes in the sand of the creek bank and hid, afraid to come out. After the soldiers had withdrawn about dark, the chief, Black Kettle, went back down the creek to find the body of his wife, but he found her still alive, although wounded in many places. He took her on his back and carried her up the creek to where the rest of us were waiting. Her story was that after she had fallen and her husband had left her, soldiers rode up and shot her several times as she lay helpless on the sand. At the Peace Council in 1865, her story was told to the Peace Commissioners, and they counted her wounds, nine in all, I believe. We were superhuman to, to survive, run through the snow, live in a teepee below zero. And you know, we're, we're proud people. We were here for a reason. And that reason is why we're here today, you know, to be able to tell our stories from these people that lost their lives for us. That night will never be forgotten as long as any of us who went through it are alive. It was bitter cold. The wind had a full sweep over the ground on which we lay, and in spite of everything that was done, no one could keep warm. All through the night, the Indians kept hollowing to attract the attention of those who had escaped from the village to the open plain and were wandering about in the dark, lost and freezing. Many who had lost wives, husbands, children, or friends went back down the creek and crept over the battleground among the naked and mutilated bodies of the dead. Few were found alive, for the soldiers had done their work thoroughly. But now and then, during that endless night, some man or woman would stagger in among us, carrying some wounded person on their back. Superhuman to carry those bodies through the night, superhuman to carry those stories for generations. Ben says, when they finally retreated, the soldiers paraded through the streets of Denver. It, it, it feels like one of the worst massacres yeah, in it, U.S. history. It is. Uh, you know, like I mentioned to you, when you massacre over 230 people and parade their body parts, and then that tell a story truthfully. They were calling it a battle from the start. They only recently started calling it a massacre. Yeah. At Denver, the men were received as heroes, and the town went wild over the victory over Black Kettle's hostiles. One evening at a Denver theater, a band of these heroes stepped upon the stage during an intermission and exhibited fully a hundred Cheyenne scalps, mostly those of women and children, while the audience cheered and the orchestra rendered patriotic airs. A few of the men had still more ghastly souvenirs. Tobacco bags made of pieces of skin cut from the bodies of dead Cheyenne women. Historian Ari Kelman says these parades were Shivington's attempt at casting the massacre as a victory. But meanwhile, Captain Silas Sewell started writing letters. Silas Sewell is working behind the scenes, sending his own letters to other leading figures in the United States military who in turn reach out to political leaders in Washington, D.C. 
making them aware of what really happened at Sand Creek. John Shivington wants everyone to believe that Sand Creek was a glorious battle. Silas Sewell counters that it was a massacre. Little more than that. A dastardly and horrible, horrible deed. It was an embarrassment to the Union. It was an embarrassment to the cause that, that Sewell believes in. Sewell's letters ultimately lead to multiple federal investigations into what happened at Sand Creek, all of which describe it as a bad act one of which calls it a massacre. And uh, and, and then Sewell is murdered in, in the streets of Denver. Ari says it's still unclear whether Sewell's murder was in retaliation for his role in bringing to light the so-called bad acts at Sand Creek. Other historians say he was gunned down by Shivington's supporters. But either way, the investigations don't lead to justice. Did it feel like um, Shivington was ever really punished no. for or, or held to justice at all? When you go down to St. Crick, you leave Eads, the place, a little ghost town called Shivington. Hardly, I don't even think there's not anybody stays there. Maybe somebody does. I know natives, they, they don't really feel, probably feel right about that town either. Neither Governor Evans nor Colonel Shivington ever faced charges of war crimes. After the attack, Shivington went on about his life, moved around the Midwest for a while, married a teenage relative, and then came back to Colorado, where he was still considered a hero. Governor Evans was run out of office and never achieved his dream of national status. But the highest peak in Colorado is named after him. Ari says it's stuff like that that just proves that... Shivington wins the memory fight, I guess is the way that you put it, for a very long period of time, and until quite recently, when there have been efforts to, to try and uh, redress that wrong. And when you lose the memory fight, it's hard to keep carrying the burden, even if you are superhuman. Growing up, Ben saw his parents struggle with trauma. Both speakers of Arapaho, his father rose to become a prominent tribal leader, and his mother, daughter of one of the tribe's spiritual elders, taught traditional arts and crafts. But they experienced abuse at Indian boarding schools. As an adult, Ben became an educator working for the Department of Education and chairman of the tribe himself. All the time, he and his family never forgot Sand Creek. They wanted to see it turned into a historic site. And then when the project started in 1998, I was co-chairman of the tribe. We talked about it with our council. And we started meeting in Denver that fall. And then we said, well, we're going to talk about how we're going to proceed in finding this site. So we did a site study that, that spring scientifically. We had our elders go down and pray. And then we um, asked oral histories from some of our tribal members to tell the history stuff from what they heard to kind of blend in thoughts, understandings of how this massacre happened. Colorado Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell of the Cheyenne Tribe also stepped up, and eventually the National Park Service designated the site. It wasn't easy. Sometimes tribal oral histories disagreed with archaeology. But Ben says since then, the Methodist Church has issued a formal apology for the atrocities committed by one of their ministers, and their congregation made a pilgrimage by charter buses to visit the site. One of the closest towns to the Sand Creek Massacre site is Lamar, Colorado. For years, their school mascot was the Lamar Savages. Recently, the school changed that to the Lamar Thunder, and each year, except during the pandemic, the Northern Arapaho has hosted the Sand Creek Spiritual Healing Run, a 180-mile relay race from Sand Creek to Denver, retracing the path of Shivington's soldiers after the massacre.
A few years back, Colorado Governor Hickenlooper met the school-age runners and had something to say. Today we gather here to formally acknowledge what happened, the massacre at Sand Creek. And we should not be afraid to criticize and condemn that which is inexcusable. So I'm here to offer something that has been too long in coming. And on behalf of the state of Colorado, I want to apologize. So Ben recognizes that Colorado is making an attempt at reckoning with this history. This year, Ben, his brother Gail, and other tribal leaders collaborated with the State of Colorado's History Museum to create an exhibit telling the story of Sand Creek from the perspective of the Arapaho and Cheyenne. On our journey to Sand Creek, Anna and I stop at the museum. Outside the exhibit, teachers give a group of middle schoolers an introduction. Historian Sam Bach tells me this exhibit isn't like any other the History Colorado Museum's ever created. You know, this was the first time History Colorado created an exhibition that was told from the pers first person perspective of a tribal community. He gives me a tour and I notice how people grow quieter and linger longer the further we wind through the exhibit. On opening day, you know, it was really shoulder to shoulder capacity in here, and the room was pretty silent. Um, you know, I think a lot of people need time to process what they're learning, and especially, you know, as we've said, given the, the, the relative newness of this story to a lot of people, um, you know, I think it, we need a contemplation time. And in fact, for that reason, um, uh, there's a a corner of this exhibit that's actually a pretty significant chunk of the floor space that's devoted to giving people a place to to process. Um, we've been calling it the contemplation room, and mm. it's it's an area with with no information. There's no artifacts. It's just photographs of the site that have been um, blown up really big to give you sort of a feeling that you're at the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site, along with audio recordings of wind and birds and bugs and stuff um, from that site to really give it an, an air of, you know, just kind of, of calmness, of, of separation, time to think, time to grieve. Toward the end, you can put on headphones and hear survivors' family members tell the stories of the massacre that have been passed down and read copies of the letters that Captain Sewell and Lieutenant Kramer wrote describing the horrors of that day in their own handwriting. It's a balm to walk into the contemplation room. The response to the exhibit has been overwhelmingly positive, Sam says. He thinks it came along at the right moment. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that in the wake of George Floyd's killing in 2020 that there's been a renewed interest in better understanding how our nation's state of race relations came to be. And so I think, you know, of course the St. Creek Massacre exhibition here at History Colorado is part of that context. but. You know, of course, it spawned a lot of different efforts. You know, renaming Mount Evans is certainly a really high profile thing that is still you know, very controversial, right? And a Civil War monument in front of the Colorado State Capitol has been removed with plans to replace it with a statue relating to Sand Creek, just one of several efforts in the state to make change. This is, speaking as a historian, you know, this is a moment, it's a very special moment in time that happens periodically in American history where, you know, we kind of hit a pause button and we all ask ourselves collectively, you know, what do we want to do differently in the future? Ben agrees that this is a special moment in history, and that's why he'd like to see more reparations for Sand Creek. The fact is, Governor Evans' vision of wiping out the Arapaho and Cheyenne from Colorado it worked. 
So now, Ben feels that some of those lands should be returned. So I'm publishing a book here next year. I want to keep continuing on to build more and more awareness in uh, Colorado and go after our reparations that are owed to us by the federal government. The Northern Arapaho are working with the city of Boulder to reclaim the land where Shivington once trained his soldiers. Mount Evans could be renamed Blue Sky Mountain after the Arapaho name for themselves. The state could give tribal members free tuition at Colorado colleges and universities. Offensive place names could be changed. More could be done to recognize what happened on Sand Creek. Ben has visited the place over 80 times in his life. What does it feel like to you when you go there? It's beautiful. But when you get to the site, you feel sad. Then we pray over there, feel better after we pray. But it's always going to have that feeling for me because you still got body parts and you still got blood that's still on the ground there. And it's always going to be there, but as long as it's healable for our future, know what happened and respect. And uh, to get over that historical trauma, it's going to be, uh, be better for the future for not only the general public, but for our people to realize that that really happened, the most notorious atrocity in America. The most notorious atrocity in America. Next time on Mending the Hoop, we'll continue the story of the Plains Indian Wars. We'll learn how, in the immediate aftermath of Sand Creek, the Lakota make a rescue mission to find the Arapaho and Cheyenne survivors left wandering the plains, and how the tribes form a fast alliance to go to war to stop westward expansion. There was great rejoicing in the village when we came in with the plunder from Julesburg. Ever since Sand Creek, the Cheyennes had been mourning for the dead, but now that the first blow had been struck in revenge, everyone began to feel better. I'm Melody Edwards. Our story editor is Ojibwe playwright Marty Strenzelwilk. Noah Greenspan is our assistant producer and line editor. Our sound designer is Charles Fournier. Luke Foring is the digital producer. Thanks also for help from Sarah Ann Leverett, Courtney Blackmer Reynolds, and Tina Unger McGee. History reenactment by Navajo Irish Denver based actor Sam Gilstrap, Marty Strenzelwilk, and Ethan Williams. Thanks especially to Northern Arapaho musicians Fred Mosqueda and Amic Birdshead for their performance of White Antelope's song. Original music by Northern Arapaho musician Christian Wallowing Bull. To see Anna Castro's photography for this season, go to our website at themodernwest.org. Our theme song is by Screen Door Porch. This podcast was produced on the University of Wyoming campus that occupies the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Crow, and Shoshone indigenous peoples, along with other native tribes who call the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain region home. We recognize, support, and advocate alongside indigenous individuals and communities who live here now and with those forcibly removed from their homelands. The Modern West is a production of PRX and Wyoming Public Media.